Hey all, it's Trainer Oblivio checking with the very first Pokemon Challenge video. I had originally set out to not make these videos, but everyone seemed like they were having fun making them, so I couldn't resist. All of that being said, however, I just wanted to try this to see if it's something that you guys will enjoy, and also if it's something that I will truly enjoy and be able to bring more of to the channel. With all that out of the way, I want to explain how these challenge videos will go, since this is the first time we will do this. I will choose a Pokemon, or a set of rules, or a combination of the two, which will set a challenge for myself. I must adhere to these rules no matter what, because to the contrary, I will fail the challenge. Simple enough, right? So in the spirit of Christmas and the holidays, in this video we will see if I can be Pokemon White with a single Cryogonal. Taking a look at the stats of this Pokemon, it has a lot of benefits and drawbacks. It has an interesting ability on Levitate which makes it immune from ground moves, but most mons packing a ground move are also packing moves such as Stone Edge or Rock Slide which do not do well with Cryogonal's pathetic defense or its ice typing. However, it has amazing speed, incredible special defense, and a very nice special attack. So that may give us a little advantage, not to mention a very decorated move pool. Okay, so for this playthrough of Pokemon White, we will be doing the following. I will only be able to use a single Cryogonal in battle. I cannot use any other Pokemon in battle, and I may only use other mons as HM slaves for story progression. The Pokemon obtained will be as is, which means I am not allowed to gen, breed, chain capture, uh, for perfect IVs, abilities, or natures, etc. It is as it comes. Um, I cannot use aid from cheats, save states, codes, or items. Items outside of battle and held items such as berries or leftovers are okay. I must get to the ending of the game and I must beat the champion, or in this case N, to do so. I specifically chose white version to make it that much harder on us. Uh, not looking forward to that Reshiram at all. Alrighty, with that out of the way, let us begin our journey throughout the Unova region. We begin our journey by selecting from our starter list, you know, the usual, Tepig, Ashwa, and of course, Cryogonal. <laughs> of course, by using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, we are able to swap Snivy out for Cryogonal. We're going to be swapping out the Grass Starter for two reasons. First, I love Snivy. It's the starter I chose across both runs of the Unova region, so naturally it's what I gravitate to. But also because that means that Sharon will be getting Tepig as its starter, which will then become the Mighty Embor and give him double the advantage over us since we are weak to both fire and fighting. Also, as a bonus, it does not give us an advantage over Bianca. Since they will be picking the Water Starter Oshawa, which means she will resist our ice moves. Now that all that is established, let's begin with the story. Bianca, whom usually is a pushover, completely dominates us in the first rival battle, partly due to an early crit we lose. We are off to a rough start, hopefully not an omen for what is to come. Right after we are challenged by Sharon, the stereotypical overtly intense anime boy, and the battle with him goes surprisingly well. I thought we would lose to him, but for sure thanks to some bad movement choice and our own crit luck, we managed to nab a victory. After we, uh ruffle the sheets up a little. <laughs> we make our way to Professor Juniper's Pokemon Lab where we receive our dexes and our journey can begin. However, once we have obtained the new Cryogonal, we promptly nickname it Alchemist because Alk is our little snowflake. <laughs> uh, the Cryogonal is Impish, which is a double-edged sword because while we appreciate the um, help to its paper-thin defenses, it does take away from Cryogonal's only useful offense. But Beggars can't be choosers, so we'll take it. After some more intro nonsense, we get together in the town square to hear Getsis get all philosophical on us. After all the rambling, we are introduced to another main character, N. So when I first played this game, I was super curious about what this player's name actually was, and N is clearly an abbreviation for something else. So I did a little searching. Well friends, fun fact, N's real name is, and I cannot make this up, Natural Groupius Harmonia. And that is a mouthful. <laughs> After a couple of ice shards, we defeat N. We barrel through the next route till we manage to get to the next round of rival battles. Let's start off by pointing out the insane amount of rival battles that this game has for you in the introductory section of this game. Like, geez, it's one after the other. Bianca's Pokemon go down fairly easy, however, Sharon presented a slightly better challenge. Before we head out into the Stradion City Gym, I took care of a couple of things. First of all, I go over to the Dream Yard, east of the city. There I can pick up 
an elemental monkey that is gifted to you to combat the first gym leader. However, we will not be using this Pokemon as it would be against the rules. So I call it Trainer Misk for his fervent obsession with monkeys and the greater ape species. Then we train up the Cryogono using a combination of the gym's trainers and a couple of wild Pokemon battles. These are our stats before the fight. Let's hope that we're able to pull through. Alrighty, so gym fight one. The fight with the gym leader Chili went about as horribly as we could have imagined it. The strategy was to set up on the Lillipup by binding it for residual damage and then yeeting as many sharpens as possible to power up the stab eye shard for the last mod. I relied on the berry to recover after getting hurt. After a couple uh, traded hits, the puppy goes down. After that, the real challenge begins. Chili sends out the fire type elemental monkey, Panseer. Panseer starts to set up workups as I start by trying to get some damage off. After trading blows, the Panseer is brought down to red health in exchange. The Cryogonal is also brought down to red health. Of course, the gym leader pops his mandatory potion on his lead even though we attempt to get a crit and clutch. We lose the match. Round 2. After that close match, I felt as if I were to try again, perhaps luck would be on my side. And it was! Through some miracle, but mostly through poor move choice because of the AI, I was able to brute force a victory that wasn't even hard to obtain. First, the Lillipup gets too greedy, setting up three too many workups, and after two ice shards, it goes down. Not only that, but after four sharpens up, we're being able to tank the incinerate with Cryagonal's high special defense, we've managed to win handily. With that, we obtain the trio badge and we're able to proceed on our journey. After a little detour with the Professor Fennel and Team Plasma in the Dream Yard, where apparently they're tripping balls? I didn't know there were psychedelics in the Pokemon universe. <laughs> Funnily enough though, there is a set of twins, Kumi and Amy, that will not allow you to progress if you do not have a double battle with them. To mitigate this, I have to use Trainer Misk, and we have him do what he does best. Exude his sexual arousal while Alchemist handles all the work. That way, there is absolutely no work done by Misk and we could progress. Following that, we have what now seems to be the mandatory rival fights. We find ourselves in a debacle with Team Plasma. After a little scuffle, we manage to return the stolen Pokemon and proceed to Nacreen City, where we will obtain our second badge. We arrive in Nacreen City, Sharon greets us at the gate and gives us some surprisingly good berries that will definitely be useful for later on. However, while there, we are faced yet again with, you guessed it, another rival match. This time with Pokemon Trainer N. Once he is defeated, he indulges us in the plot of the game. Neat. After using the team of local mons that he whipped up for this encounter and getting defeated by a snowflake, we proceed into the gym. No real issues with the gym trainers, so let's move on to the main event. Gym fight number two. So we start off with the battle doing almost 50% HP on the leader's gym leader Lenora's Herdier. In return, I get hit with the Leer, which I thought would have been a clean easy KO. But Herdier then has to live on 1 HP and returns with a takedown that leaves Cryogonal with 10 HP and takes itself out in the process. Her leader Watchhog comes out and it is more than evident to me that we cannot win this fight at the current level that we are in due to how hard Herdier and Watchhog's attacks are hitting with our pitiful defense stat. Alright, grind time. So round 2, after a couple of Autono fights, we managed to get Cryogonal's level to 25. Here's what it's looking like. That defense staff is still pretty incredibly low, and I know we're going to need some terrible in-game AI luck in order to win this battle. However, on the bright side, I did manage to remember to put a Chesto Berry that we got gifted from Sharon earlier on on Cryogonal this time. And um, along the way, as we train, we managed to learn Aurora Beam. It is a decently powerful ice type move coming off of its higher special attack stat with a 10% chance to reduce the opponent's attack. Much of this battle remained the same. She leads with Herdier, which she tries to use takedown turn 1. Between recoil damage and the Aurora Beam, we manage to get Herdier in potion range. Good. I would rather that she starts to get them out of the system now. We follow up with an Ice uh, Shard thinking that we can nab the KO, but the Aurora Beam right after finished the job. In a very lucky turn of events, the Watchhog does not for some unknown reason use Retaliation and completely obliterate Cryogonal as I expected, but instead we smack it with, with an Aurora Beam. Lenora's Watchhog lands a Hypnosis, which is promptly healed by the Sharon's Chesto Berries. Who said that the rivals were completely useless, huh? <laughs> and with that, the follow up with another Aurora Beam and that's the match. With this victory, we are able to obtain the basic badge and proceed onward. Blah blah blah, Team Plasma, nonsense, blah blah, and basically they steal a dead Dragonite Hem, which, um, okay. After this we are introduced to the next gym leader in the challenge, Berg. 
uh, two of us scurry over to the Pinwheel Forest where we are tasked with tracking down and bringing Team Plasma to justice. Or something like that. After a couple grunt fights, the whole charade is over and we get the skull returned to Lenora and proceed to the Sky Arrow Bridge. Easily one of the coolest locations of this game. It's quite a shame that in both adventures through Unova, they do not seem to utilize this space very well, but in my opinion, it's just a missed opportunity. Especially with the landscape that was modeled after the Brooklyn Bridge here in New York City. On the other side, however, we arrive in Castellia City. So the cool thing about this city is not just that it's based off of New York City, but that it is a focal point of the game and a huge inspiration for it. During the travels for the launch events for Generation 4 games, they traveled to New York. This was a first for a lot for the team, but series director and composer Junuchi Masuda was enamored with New York. He was thoroughly impressed with the immense amount of diversity that was all encompassed in one city. Another cool tidbit was being a composer, Junuchi had a personal stake that one day his compositions would make their ways to some world-renowned theater such as the Carnegie Hall. Unfortunately, this would not come to pass for Masuda. Alrighty, nerd ran over. <laughs> Back to what we're here for. After wandering around for a bit, we find ourselves at the gym, but before entering it, there seems to be some trouble afoot. Upon further investigation, we find that one of Bianca's Pokemon has been stolen. After beating some butt, we find ourselves in another encounter with Getsis and two of the Seven Sages. This time, it seems Berg, the gym leader, is the one getting all philosophical, so after a quick exchange, Bianca's Muna is returned to her, and all is well. We know what that means. Gym time, baby. Not a whole lot to report in this gym, though. The trainers were fairly easy, and so was Berg. The battle was very brief as we swept right through it. It was expect I was expecting his Dwebble to present more of a problem, but it went down in one shot, so badge obtained. Let's roll. <laughs> Leaving the gym, we receive a call from Acevedo's mom. <clears throat> I mean, uh, Bianca. She informs us that we will be challenged by her to another rival fight. Yippee. So during this fight, we only really struggled with her duo. That is to be expected, however, since this is her strongest mon, and we purposefully made it to where facing either rival would suck. But now comes a different beast, Sharon. We had to attempt this Sharon fight twice because it had some power creep, but also because of bad luck. At this point of the game, we are incredibly outleveling and outmuscling the competition. Therefore, most NPCs are a breeze, even when they have the type advantage or resistance, but not Sharon. The first uh, Sharon battle went as follows. Sharon leads with the pit of, and I immediately formulate a strategy to want to take full advantage of the low level bird mon. I take the opportunity to stop setting up our newly acquired Acid Armor. Acid Armor is a poison type status move that boosts the defense of a Pokemon by two stages. This being said, I set up enough on the Pigeon Mon that I will be bulky enough to take hits from the heavier hitting mods such as Pig Knight. However, we get unlucky by getting taunted with a Leer and then getting hit by quick attacks. And between them and the Sandstorm chip damage, uh, our health is whittling away fast. So it would not matter how high our defense is if we did not have the HP to take a couple of hits and a couple of rounds of Sandstorm. Knowing all of this, we press forward knocking out the pit of in one hit. Then Pignite gets sent out and this is where it all goes south. Pignite's flame charges are doing way too much damage for us to live through it, let alone the rest of the battle. Not only this, but every turn it's boosting its speed with flame charging, forcing us to counter with the weaker icy wind. Because if it outspeeds, that's the match. After a couple of exchanges, the Pig Knights pops a Citrus Berry, reversing all of our hard work, and after another hit or two, we are felt. I know I can win this match, I just need better luck. Once I'm able to do that, the rest should be a breeze. Just needed a retry a couple of times till I got it right. And luckily, on our second try, we got exactly what we were looking for. The strategy remained the same, but the outcome was drastically different. After being able to set up some acid armors and maxing our defense, we are tanking everything. Not only that, but I think the AI forgot how to battle because when Pig Knight came out, it began to do dumb things such as using defense curls for no apparent reason. With Pig Knight out of the way, and with just enough remaining HP, we secure a victory. Pig Knight is just a middle stage mon that did not have the defenses to withstand the hard hits that we threw at it. The rest of the team was a sweep due to the frailty, however we struggled with Pig Knight, and he hasn't fully evolved yet. This encounter does not make me look forward to the future fights with Sharon. After crossing the desert, we arrive in Mbasa City. Upon our arrival, we are jumped by some Team Plasma goons that are fate easily dispatched. After the battle, we happen upon our first TM shop, which just so happens to have their move Return. Now, what Return is, for those of you who do not know, it's a physical normal type move that gets stronger and stronger with the bond shared between uh, Pokemon and Trainer. 
This is based off of friendship values, which are based off of several things such as winning battles, using items, and generally making Cryogonal happy. Since Cryogonal has such a barren move pool in this generation, we do not have any coverage. This potentially may be helpful. We will see though. Just as a fun little side note, we go to the musical theater and dress Misk up for the special contests. Something tells me that this monkey will resonate with the actual trainer Misk. <laughs> Afterwards, we learn the rest of the plot ever so graciously from N after confessing his love to us, uh, I mean confessing his role to us as the king of Team Plasma. We are challenged to a rival battle. This one was a little too close. He leads with Sandal, which is an Oko, but then comes Darumaka. This little thing is too strong. With one fire punch, it brings us down to 4 HP, and then this psychopath has the nerve to say that my Pokemon are having fun. No, N. Not after melting Alk like that. Right after the cutscene unfolds where N reveals his intentions with the legendary dragon Pokemon and challenges us to attempt to stop him. Well, guess we got a challenge within a challenge. <laughs> After this, we yet again have another gym, where sadly I do not have a lot to say. The gym trainers are absolutely no problem at all, and Alyssa has a team that has two flying types. Ergo, two thirds of her team are weak to ice, and Zeb Shrika is kind of a breeze too, especially uh, after we froze it with our new ice beam. So yay, another gym badge. From here we have Clay's gym, being a ground type gym, and we have Skyla's gym, which are both very weak to ice. So from this moment on, I will not be including gym battles if it is a complete wash, as that would be very boring. We are here to watch me writhe and struggle, so struggling you shall receive. <laughs> After leaving Mbasa City, we quickly and easily make our way over to the next checkpoint without a hiccup whatsoever. <laughs> nah, no, just kidding. This is Gen 5, baby. Time for your daily dose of rival fight. Alright, so Sharon challenges us right outside of the gate to Route 5. He leaves with Lipard and claps us with a cheap fake out. After this, we take the prime opportunity to use Lipard to set up like we did on the last battle. A couple of asset armors later and we are feeling confident enough to take on some super effective blows. One Ice Beam takes down the Lipard, Pig Knight comes out and we slap it with return and holy crud! I know we have a huge level advantage but I did not think that Cryogno's horrendous attack would do that amount of damage. I am impressed. Anyways. Pig Knight eats a citrus berry for a little bit of recovery and we eat up the following flame charge and finish the Pig Knight off. The rest of the battle is a sweep with Ice Beam. So I think after this it's safe to say that unless we struggle in future rival battles, we will be following suit as we do for the gym battles. After some battles on Route 5 and a quick cutscene, we arrive in Funky Town! Ah, uh, just kidding. We arrive in Driftville City, but we unfortunately arrive to the news that Team Plasma has snuck into the city as a result of the drawbridge uh, being lowered to receive us. Ergo, we have to find them chillin' in the cold storage. <laughs> we promptly beat them to proceed sweeping Clay's gym and moving on to the Charged Stone Cave. Before we leave, however, we pick up the Shell Bell. The Shell Bell will heal us after uh, using a damaging move, so this could turn the tide of some battles and prove to be pretty useful. When we arrive in the Charged Stone Cave, we are attacked by ninjas. Nah, I'm just kidding. We are introduced to a peculiar set of individuals that are known as the Shadow Triad. Under Team Plasma, and namely N's command, they bring me to him where he lets me know that we will have a, a battle to determine whose dream will come true, and that Team Plasma's members will be waiting in the lower levels of the cave to test me. Wonderful. After this, me, uh, we meet with Professor and Bianca and receive the Lucky Egg. Great! For those who do not know what the Lucky Egg is, the Lucky Egg is a held item uh, that is supposed to boost the experience gain of a Pokemon. It actually boosts the experience by 50%, which will be super helpful later on when Cryogonite needs a couple of levels to grind out. Not much to say about the cave other than that some of the rock and steel types were a little bit of trouble, but nothing too bad, and Team Plasma was a bunch of pushovers. At the end of the cave, however, we have our fight with N. 
He leads with Boulder, so that is kind of bad news for us. We try our luck and smack it with an Ice Beam to bring it down to its 30. Luckily, the AI decides it would be a good time to set up an Iron Defense, so we get by very easily. The rest of the battle is pretty much an Ice Beam sweep. After getting through the Charge Stone Cave, we get to Minstraughton City. Here we'll be challenging the Flying Type Gym Leader Skyla, but spoiler alert, it's a total wash. <laughs> Hilariously, however, before we are able to fight Skyla, we do have to make it through this sequence at the Celestial Tower where we ring the bell for the departed Pokemon and sue the Pokemon there so that Skyla can give us access to the gym and then subsequently the batch. Well, in this tower, I thought it would be a great idea to press forward because there is a nurse that heals your Pokemon on the upper floors, so I would replenish my health and my power points there. And of course, I get bodied. I think the funniest thing about the whole debacle is that I told myself I only have one ice beam, so hopefully as long as I do not encounter two ghost types, I should be okay. Because if I do, I'll be wild. And of course, shoutouts to Psychic Mickey here who just had to have two ghost types to wall us completely. I tried to spam Confuse Ray and pray that it would hit itself, but in the end, we lost. Moving forward, we decimate Sharon in another rival battle, meet up with Clay again, proceed to Twist Mountain with very little trouble, and finally arrive in Icarus City. You know, so far, the mid-game of this challenge has been a breeze. I'm hoping that this will carry over into the late game, but I am certain that we will enc encounter a brick wall soon. Alright, so we begin with, uh, nope, nada. I got nothing. So... Of course guys, Streamlabs decides to do a thing and my video died shortly after recording. So I don't have anything for this section of the uh, <laughs> of the recording. I will however recap some of the major plot points that we'd hit along the way. First thing is we obtain the gym badge from uh, leader Bryson. The plot furthers and is recognized as the hero of Unova by Reshiram and the legendary Pokemon uh, in the Celestial Tower. We are tasked with seeking the counterpart to Reshiram, and in doing so we chase Team Plasma back to the Relic Castle and defeat them only to turn nothing up. We receive a call from the Professor to hurry over to the museum where we receive the Dark Stone which is what we need to awaken Zekrom. Perfect. Alright, so we're all caught up. Now finally, we're able to progress the story back here just north of Icarus City on Route 8. We now have a new sense of purpose which is to stop N from fulfilling the dreams of Team Plasma and as such, we embark. There is nothing much to report here other than a cool little tidbit in Icarus City. Uh, for true fans, you will remember this specific Team Rocket grunt that tried to sabotage Kanto region by taking the machine part out of the power plant. Well as it turns out, he grew up, got a wife, and had a kid and moved to a quiet little mountain village to live out the rest of his life in peace. Kinda hype for the story arc to come full circle like that. <laughs> well anyways, moving on. At the end of the route, we fight uh, with Bianca, but as per usual, it was nothing to write home about. We zoom way past through Tubaline Bridge, and at the end was... Uh, whoa, hey, calm down, we don't do that on this channel, relax, mad sus, yo. <laughs> Alright, we find Getsis with his posse of mean girls, where he tries to dissuade me to try to take down the whole operation, likely because he is scared of losing. We proceed to rush past Route 9 and make it to Opelucid City. There we get yet another attempt from Getsis to brainwash the masses to which we are still determined to do the appointed tasks afterwards. After a quick spiel about the legend of Unova, we have to face Iris in the gym. And nothing to really say about it. It was a complete one-sided match, four ice beams later, and we have the badge. Time for the real challenge, the Elite Four and the Championship. Still wondering if we can complete the challenge because I know for a fact that there are three brick walls that I can name off the top of my head in our current position. First of all, Marshall lived the Elite Four with all of his fighting types. And with his casual self and a whole legendary with his signature fire move on his team. And gets this with his toxic Kefragergus. Well, little did I know that the brick walls would begin a lot sooner than that. Enter. Sharon. <laughs> right, so before we enter the victory road, Sharon decides to test you to make sure that you are the hero worthy of the Darkstone. And well, let's just say, maybe when you begin to question that I am only running around with a cryogonal, you'd probably also question and be doubtful if I'm worthy of being the hero. Anyways, on to the battle. Sharon leads with his uh, unfazant while I try to get up my acid armor to prep for his terrifying embor. After a taunt, I'm only able to get up one before unfazant goes down to an ice beam. Then Embor happens. I start slapping it with acrobatics, which does a fair good amount of damage, however with one critical hit, I go down. I'm going to hate that sentence as it's going to be the only thing that I'll be saying for the rest of the video. Yay. <laughs> Alright, round two. 
and we do significantly better by taking Amphazon as a prime opportunity to set up. We get taunted after the first asset armor as per usual, but instead of knocking it out, it keeps itself around with the tech and razor one, allowing us to stave off the taunt and set up another asset armor before taking it out. This puts us in a much better position to deal with the remainder of the team. Ambor comes out and this time we are able to not get hit by a critical and eat up its moves. However, the trade-off is that Cryogonal gets freaking burned. Figures. Just my luck. Miraculously though, after struggling with the burn and leftovers past re recovery from the Ambor, we defeated and the rest of the team pretty much a sweep. Alrighty boys. So here we are, we made it to the Elite Four. Barely. A special mention has to go to this veteran trainer just before the exit of the victory road. He one-shot my Karagonal with a stone edge. At this point, it is more than apparent that we are struggling with the later game mods and the power that is starting to catch up to us. Things are not looking so good as we approach the end of our run here. Here are Karagonal stats. We are just a level 60 stitch, which I think for Karagano should be decent enough level, and we have just enough bulk to make it past the mods aside from the fighting variation. Alright, so let's get down to the juicy stuff. First, we attempt Grimsley, thinking it'd be an easy start to the Elite Four, and to start training up for the battles to come. And, of course, we struggle with this fight. Well, not terribly, we just get some bad luck. All things considered, this fight could have been a lot worse. So now, let's get into the battle. Grimsley leaves with this Scrafty, a fighting type. Great. Well, we immediately start setting up as many asset armors as possible. Scrafty st uh, starts out by lowering my accuracy with Sand Attack. Not good. The thing about these single Pokemon runs is that there's uh, only so many PP that you have on a move, even at max PP, and there's only so many ethers and elixirs that are given to you throughout the game in order to replenish them. So to have us missing a bunch of times when we need to be knocking out various Pokemon from various trainers in succession is no bueno. Continuing the fight, we have a uh, good back and forth of me missing moves and tanking moves thanks to our setup and burning through our power points. After some traded blows, we take out the Scrafty, and then we one-shot the Crocodile easy, but the challenge really starts when he sends out the Bisharp. I have nothing super effective or even effective for that matter. It's all resisted hits and nothing even that I could replace my moves with in order to make it easier. Ergo, I have to brute force my way through the Bisharp. This fight gets a little brutal, brutal on this bit. The resisted hits give him enough time to chunk away at our HP with super effective Metal Claws, which occasionally boosts its attack for more damage. And when we do actually manage to get his health down to knockout range, Grimsley pops the mandatory full restore, and we are back at square one. I cannot win. With only two power points left for Ice Beam, I need to have much better luck with accuracy and hope this Scrafty does not spam Sand Attack at the beginning of the battle. Alright, so round two, <clears throat> and unfortunately it goes exactly as round one. Too few PP to get through this by Sharp. Alright, so round three, it goes much better than the last two rounds. I get a super lucky freeze on turn 1 with Ice Beam. This allows us to save our power points and I take the opportunity to set up one acid armor and take it down on the next turn and free of it thawing out and spamming sand attack. Crocodile goes down on one Ice Beam again and out comes Bisharp. This time we're much better prepared. Hilariously, we still miss the first Ice Beam and Metal Claw puts us under half HP. We miss the next one and I gotta go for a recover to avoid losing to a crit. The next Metal Claw does big damage and gives Bisharp a big attack boost. Uh oh. We recover and after the Night Slash we take two Metal Claws while in the back and forth and in the end, even with that luck, we lose. Alrighty, well since we keep losing it looks like it's time to train. Since we are so close, we'll train it to level 70. We are back from the grind and here are Alchemist's stats. Gave it the Never Melt Ice to power up Ice Beam, so let's give this another go. Grimsley is with Scrafty and as usual I try my setup. Sand Attack comes out and I begin to worry, so... Not taking any more chances, we smack it with an Ice Beam. Luckily, we do enough damage to get him to use his full restores early, so he does not have the chance to use them on Bisharp. He avoids the next Ice Beam, but we manage to get a lucky crit to take it out. Crocodile is still a one-shot with the Ice Beam, and then it's Bisharp time. We are in much better shape for the, this time, and we start by setting up the remaining Acid Armors. Metal Claw still does a huge chunk, and we risk the, another Acid Armor in crit range. It pays off, though, as we survive and recover. And of course, wouldn't you know it, my luck kicks in and we lose to a critical slash. Ah, uh, alrighty. We were so close. We made good progress in that battle and I want to capitalize on it, so we try this again. This time, the stars line. 
We don't get hit by the sand attack, manage to get up our acid armors, and free Scrafty and White Ice Beam and take him down on the next. That's crazy lucky. We brush past Crocodile and Bisharp comes out. Without the sand attack, we are always hitting and we are not getting hit too hard thanks to setting up. We go back and forth until another critical hits us, this time from Metal Claw. This is crazy. Even with all of this luck, we are going into attempt number 6 of this fight with no success. We are not quitting, however. We set up on Scrafty as it spams sand attack and it goes down after a, a couple of ice beams. We take the Crocodile down as usual and in comes Bisharp. We are usually all set up so we take this hits fairly well and, the back and, f and through the back and forth we finally, through some good luck, manage to beat the Bisharp with 17 HP to spare. The Lipard, his final Pokemon comes out and my heart skips a beat. Lipard uses Fake Out. <laughs> but we live thanks to the setup and we take it out on the next turn with one Ice Beam. It took way too many tries for this fight, and that was the first of the Elite Four. I am not looking forward to the Marshall fight. We heal up and restore PP before going over into the next fight. This time, we attempt Caitlyn and see how it goes. Well, it went pretty great. <laughs> this battle was a breeze, especially when in contrast to the previous battle with Grimsley. We pretty much get through her team with ease for with a couple of Ice Beams for all of her Pokemon, and the last one was for Sigilyph, and that's a wrap. Feels nice. Okay, next Elite Four member is Chantel. I know that she will be fairly easy till it comes to the Pokemon that aren't named Chandelure and the wall that is Jellicent. Well, here we go. Kafagagus comes out and we trade blows. She goes down to two Ice Beams, which I am grateful for, and next comes out Chandelure. We try to hit it with Ice Beam, which does about one quarter damage, and in return we get hit with the Fire Blast. It stinks. We are then caught in a Fire Blast Recover Chain, and I am hoping that it misses with at least one Fire Blast since it only has an 85% chance of landing. But of course, this is my luck we're talking about, and she lands every last one of them. This puts us in a bad spot for the rest of the battle, but we are able to outlast the power points for Fire Blast, so she starts to hit us with weak paybacks. We try to chip away with Acrobatics and Ice Beam, but we have no luck. She pops a full restore right when she is at red health, and I think we have seen this before. It is the buy sharp all over again. After several traded hits, the Chandelure goes down, but not without leaving us with one minus in special defense and very weakened. Golurk goes down in one hit, but Jellison is too much for us to handle in that weakened state. This battle is difficult, but doable. We just need better luck. Okay, here we go one more time. Trafagragus manages to get off a burn on us, putting us onto a really bad start. It goes down much the same, however, but Chandelure now has the burn to set me back even further. But not all is bad. We managed to take it down way easier than last time, despite the burn, partly due to some accuracy luck making the Fire Blast miss. Golurk is still a one-shot, and now it's time for Jellison, the wall that stands in the path of our victory. We start by healing off some of the burn damage, which has now racked up pretty nicely to get ourselves back to full and in good condition for the fight. The fight is slow as we are both special tanks, but thanks to Solar Beam that we equipped right before the battle, we are able to take the Jellison down. Good, another one down. Couple more to go. Now for the part that I was dreading the most. Here is Marshall's team. It only has fighting types, and they all hit significantly hard in their own right, but now with my incredible base 30 defense and being weak to all of their moves, this makes for one scary ass battle. We start off strong by setting up on Ernie and getting off all the defense boosts demanded for this fight. He misses a couple of stone edges which give us enough time to smack him with an ice beam which puts them in full restore range. Great, getting them out of the way. He uses it and we freeze it with the next ice beam, making him use the last full restore. Awesome. I am very happy with that. Two acrobatics later and it goes down. Out comes Bert and he is not too happy about what happened to Ernie, so he bodies me with one critical stone edge. And so it begins. Round 2 and throw is pretty much the same, save for a stone edge that he lands. Saw comes out and since it's frailer than throw we manage to get Marshall to use his full restores on it and one ice beam and acrobatics later and it also goes down. We level up and <laughs> I'm sure we're gonna win now. Out comes Conkledur which is felled by an ice beam and we make it to Marshall's ace Mian Shao. Two ice beams later and the fight is over. Um, what? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, Bisharp ran our set like there was no tomorrow, but the fighting type specialist? Nah, that was a breeze. Oh well, 
I'm not complaining. Moving on. We have defeated the Elite Four, but now on to the most challenging part of the game. We learn that Alder's hippie self gets beaten by a kid packing a legendary. What a surprise. And that we must now face him in some epic final showdown. Suddenly, Team Plasma's castle pops up from underneath the earth and we are surrounded. And disappears, waiting at the end of his castle for the final fight. Let's go give it to him. After exploring the castle, we make it to the end where Getsis tries to dissuade us one last time before we enter the final battle. But Oblivio does not do well with listening, so we enter and begin the sequence. Before we begin the battle, however, the Darkstone recognizes us as the hero that pursues ideals and wants to come out to our aid. Therefore, we are forced to capture it. Like, no, seriously, check this out though. Uh, we tried running from it, we tried fainting it, we tried to even let it kill us. But in the end, unfortunately, we had to catch it. Because without it, we would have no story progression. <laughs> and then the battle begins. Sadly, the game wants this big epic face-off in the end with the box legendaries as the climax of the game, but we cannot have that in this challenge run. So we try to play Pokemon Coliseum <laughs> and steal other trainers' Pokemons, <clears throat> but they end up calling me a thief and swatting the Pokeballs away, which is kind of racial, not gonna lie. But we allow Zekrom to faint by doing nothing and wasting turns, and that is when the real challenge begins. Al comes out and luckily on Recharge's turn of Hyper Beam, which allows us to hit Reshiram with a pretty hard Ice Beam. Then we start setting up Acid Armors while it spams Fusion Flare. We enter a little dance of uh, Flare and Restore, which we ultimately win due to the higher power point. This tactic works and we are able to set up for the rest of the battle, and we are able to take Reshiram out with a couple more Ice Beams. In comes Clink Clang, which happens to be the Zoroark, which goes down in one hit. After that, Karakosta comes to Rumble, and after a couple well-placed Ice Beams and Acrobatics, we are able to take it down. Archaeops is an Oko with Ice Beam, and Vanillix comes out for a very annoying back and forth. It has Flash Cannon so it can hit me hard, but I've got nothing to hit it back with. And after a grueling couple of minutes, we manage to get the knockout. By the time we get to his final Pokemon though, we are weakened and only have two recovers left. We use one up to tank the incoming Flash Cannon and return with our Ice Beam bringing it down to just above 50 HP. We then recover on the next turn to avoid going down. The Flash Cannon connects and so does our subsequent Ice Beam. We are now both on our last legs. This is it. I thought he was going to pop the mandatory full restore and end me, but luckily we bring end down hanging by a thread. Alrighty, one hurdle down and one last one to go before we call this a wrap. Gets this. So after losing his shit, he goes off on end, being nasty and turns his attention to us. We accept the challenge and begin to fight Satan. I mean, seriously though, listen to this. If this does not sound like the theme played when trying to summon the Dark Lord himself, then I don't know what does. <laughs> but anyways, at this point we still do have Zekrom on us, so we have to let him eat up hits from Kefragrigus so that it may faint and we may continue with Cryogonal. In some incredible stroke of luck, we manage to get the freeze off on Kefragrigus before it can slap a Toxic on us. Hydreigon comes out and it is a one shot thankfully, and then our old rival shows up, Bisharp. We tried to set up on it and thankfully this Bisharp has a different moveset from the one that we fought, but in the end of it all, it takes one critical stone edge to end us. Okay, so we lose on our first try. So let's talk about this real quick. He has a tank, which is Kerfagrigus with a toxic protect combo. And if it manages to get toxic off on the first turn, before we do anything, then it's game over. Poison has an anomalous effect and lowers your Pokemon's defense stat by a certain percentage. With an already pitiful defense and absolutely no way for us to heal off the poison which racks on every turn, it's a death sentence since we won't get through these Pokemon before he manages to knock us out. Then if we do manage to get through, we are going to have to have round 2 with Bisharp and his crit happy self, which tanks all of our moves and ends which will end us in the long run of the match. So to recap, we need to not get poisoned on turn 1, end the tank, not uh, get one shot by any critical hit or bodied by any super effective move, Set up enough defenses to get past our nemesis by Sharp. Then, after all of that, we'll have to face and defeat the rest of the team. Simple enough, right? Oh boy, we're gonna need some serious luck. Alright, well long story short, boys. We attempt this battle 10 different exhausting times before we can finally claim a victory. Sometimes, we would get an attempt with amazing luck like... This one, where I did not get poisoned, kill the Krafagravis with the critical ice beam, move past the high dragon, set up my defenses, did not get killed by the by sharp, beat it with the, and the following Electros, only to get pummeled by a critical head charge from the Bofalon. 
That was painful, but thankfully on the next couple of attempts we were able to secure the bag and beat this challenge. So, <laughs> that was a fun one. I have been wanting to do something like this for you guys for a good minute now, and I am incredibly happy to have been able to do it. It has been a blast to make this, and I am super excited to hear from you guys in the comments section below. Did you guys like this type of video? Did you want to see more? Or let me know what kinds of videos did you guys want to see more of. Thank all of you guys so much, and for anyone who is new, if you happen to like what you've seen, dropping a like, share, or subscribe helps tremendously. Well, we answered the question, can you beat Pokemon White version with only one Coriogonal? Yes, you can. <laughs> Alrighty boys, I am Trainer Oblivio, and until next time, Trainer Oblivio, checking out. Have a good one.